Hello and welcome to another week of Heroes Veritas member call. Really appreciate everybody that's on. Uh, looks like it's going to be a small group today. And that's okay. Um, this will be up on the recording uh, here uh, probably in the next couple of days. So if you're just catching the recording, um, you know, and have any questions, as always, you can always throw them in the member portal, throw them in the chat. Um, so today's our faith call. And I know that one of the bigger questions is what is it about? Um, is it religion? Is it spirituality? And there's, yes, all of that stuff. Hey, Matt, glad you were able to join us. Um, but today I want to talk about the topic of faith and self. Um, a big part of the faith part of the, the faith mechanism, especially as a pillar within heroes, uh, falls in line with how do we keep um, our head up and our shoulders square when all hell seems to break loose, uh, things are going awry, things are not going as we planned, things are not going as we had hoped. Um, maybe there's dark times, maybe you're stuck in the abyss. Uh, I know myself, I, I deal with this on a regular occurrence, and so I really wanted to talk to you guys about this. But before we get started and jumping into that topic, one, make sure everybody can hear me. Can I get a thumbs up on camera? Cool, cool. Um, two, uh, some admin stuff. Again, we grow as much as you guys let us grow. So let your friends know uh, we're a tribe of people that want to see them win, want to see them grow and acquire and develop their own personal sovereignty. So if you know anybody that's a good fit for the portal, um, whether that's in what you see in their potential uh, or what they bring to the table right now, and you want to see them thrive and be a part of this tribe, be sure to send them a link to the portal, get them in. Uh, two, uh, we have a few months left uh, before Sovereign Summit. Sovereign Summit's coming up in June, June 22nd. They're in Dallas, Texas. And uh, right now, uh, tickets are on sale. Registration is live. So go ahead and get your tickets. It's a three-day event where we teach you all the uh, tactics, the real like applicability tactics to developing your personal sovereignty. A lot of times you think of these conferences and they're just a bunch of talking heads getting up on stage and saying, hey, here's this completely unapplicable concept that is as nebulous as it is, you know, useless to you in your really day to day life. Sovereign Summit is an opportunity for us to give you real tangible things that as soon as you walk out those doors, day one, you'll have things that you can work on and you can go and develop uh, that'll lead you to a, a much more fulfilling life, developing more confidence, more self-respect and overall uh, leading you to a more personally sovereign existence. So uh, if you know anybody that could use that, if you yourself could use that, definitely get registered as soon as possible. Um, we're setting up the logistics of that right now, and we hope to see you there. It'd be a great time. Uh, one thing that we lose in this virtual portal, um, I don't know why it came out that way, virtual portal, um, we lose the energy of community. We lose the connection piece. And so, uh, in addition to all the things I just mentioned about Sovereign Summit, being in place with your tribe, with an energetic, uh, energetically aligned group does something for your mindset, your heart, your spirit. And so getting us into one place is an absolute um, necessity for kind of skyrocketing your growth. And so we really hope to see you all there. Uh, again, those tickets are on sale now. Uh, February 18th, uh, I will be plate loading at uh, Tish's uh, gym. Uh, during their powerlifting event, and then it will be followed up with a little bit of a meet and greet with me as a hero sponsored event. Deborah will be there, uh, Tish will be there. So if you guys want to come out and check out a bunch of cool lifters doing cool things, be sure to come out and I think it's a door. I think there's a door feed and, and all that information can come out um, through Tish. But um, we'd love to have you guys out there, love to connect with you guys in person. Uh, I'm excited for that. Uh, it's not easy plate loading and unloading. I've done it once before for Tish. Uh, it's exhausting. Uh, generally speaking, I spent three and a half hours doing it the first time. Uh, I was pretty sore the next day. Uh, by the second half of the day, I just, I told everybody I'll be there if you need me, but uh, I'm going to take a step back and just watch because uh, I was pretty toasted. There were some guys that were pulling some pretty big weights where we had four people uh, helping them out, five people technically with one behind. And, and so you'll see me out there swapping plates and, and calling commands to the team there. And then follow up, You can we can sit down and talk at the end of the day, get some food in, in those volunteers and, and have a good conversation about Heroes. So I'm excited for that as well. Um, in March, we will be planning another live event, in-person event. We haven't really figured out the logistics of that yet, but we're trying to do one a month in person um, and make that available to everybody uh, for free to the public uh, so that we can get our name out there and start building our tribe and our community. 
Uh, so look forward to details on that in March as well. So without further ado, getting into the topic, what everybody's here today for um, is faith. And so, as I mentioned, I want to talk about faith and self, because the number one issue that you see in society today is a glorious acceptance of mediocrity. We have an absolute miscalibrated malignment with mediocrity. In fact, anybody that seeks greatness, if they don't get it right out the gate, are oftentimes diminished, disqualified. They are treated poorly because how dare they risk greatness and fall short? How dare they strive for something bigger than themselves, something that they can leave their children, a legacy, um, an impossible feat? And I think that that's really sad. I think that that's, a, that's something that we need to change within society. And that's something we do here at Heroes. Uh, in, in in general, humans are hardwired for greatness. They're hardwired to push back the abyss. They're hardwired to push the envelope and do the impossible. Uh, you know, the Wright brothers invented flight. They were probably called crazy. And the first time somebody saw them, they were probably heralded as witches or, you know, demon worshipers. I mean, that's the level of um, construct that we put on ourselves as humans and those those limits that we put on ourselves. But now, if anybody said that it's impossible to fly as a human, people would think they're crazy because we have planes flying any which way that you can think of at any given time during the day. And that impossibility was only impossible until it was possible. And so when you think about what we're doing in society right now is we no longer look high enough to build great things. Once upon a time, we built great temples, we built great structures, we sculpted and had creative arts that left a legacy. In fact, if you look at ancient civilizations, what we remember of those civilizations is only that which was left by their artisans, that which was left by people who dared to record in some way, fashion, or format their culture um, in a great and persistent way. And I can think of no other way to do that in today's world than seeking greatness internally. And so we have this idea, this construct that... If I get a good job and I work till I'm 70 and I burn myself out and then I retire on maybe $3,000 a month with, you know, whatever, that's the life. That's that's winning. That's success, right? And, and I challenge each and every one of you to think about that a little bit deeper. Is that really success working for 65 years to retire on $3,000 a month and waste away inside of some hospital because you really don't have anything else to do. You've retired, you have no hobbies, and then you give way to depression and abyss. Those who have been around people of greatness realize that their biggest fear is regret. They're, and that it isn't so much courage that pushes them to do great things. It's fear. They fear being average. They fear wasting a life. They fear having regrets. And that fear drives the courage because it's not so much that they're braver than you. It's just that they realize that they're more scared of the alternative than you are. And so as we calibrate what we believe is possible, what we believe is great, what we believe is even feasible, we have to look at it from that perspective is what are your items? And Matt and I have talked about this quite a bit. Like we don't do bucket lists. We do to-do lists. Bucket lists are where ideas and dreams go to die. Like it is literally a place where you can put a pen in it and say one day, someday, when everything's perfect, when things happen. And the reality of that is that day will never come. That someday is always the next day. That that when everything's perfect is there's one more thing you have to get right. So bucket lists are where dreams and visions go to die. Make a to-do list and give it a date. And so in order to do that, you have to have that strong faith in yourself. And maybe it's, I fear having regrets, so I have to have faith in myself because otherwise I will have those regrets, right? So when you have those things taking place in your life where you're feeling a, a, a pull, and and I'm I'm gonna I'm writing my book right now, and so this is very fresh in my mind. One of the things that is part of the hero's journey is the call to action, and what we've done as a society is we've suppressed the intuition that we feel towards that call to action. And over time, we ignore it. 
but it keeps popping up. Every once in a while, just it snaps us awake when we're sleeping. We'll be in a daydream, and all of a sudden, we're like, man, I wish I did this. 20 years down the line, 30 years down the line, 40 years down the line, we're sitting there in our office, typing away with poor posture, miserable as all hell because we're sick all the time because we have no fucking function because we haven't done anything with ourselves, wondering how we got to that point. Well, that place is born from repressing that call to action. Whether you press it from fear of failure, whether you press it from fear of judgment, whether you repress it because, you know, something in you said it's not possible. I challenge each and every one of you to seek that call to action again. Sit with it. Sit outside at night with nothing. Don't bring your fucking phone. Don't have the radio on. Just sit with the sounds of the evening. And some of us, that's the sound of the freeway. Some of that's, that's the white noise of crickets and, and frogs. Um, you know, where I live, there's uh, a slough in the back uh, behind my house. And that slough is a breeding ground for frogs. And so right now they're all breeding. And so all I have is just a deafening sound of croaks and, and hollow sounds from frogs in my backyard. So last night when I was sitting out there, I had a full moon. Uh, the lights were all off and I just sat in the back and listened to the frogs. But in that moment, I realized that there were certain things that I was avoiding, um, like my book, because I was afraid that once I wrote it, I couldn't go back and change it, right? If my ideas change, if I grow, if I change the way I think about things, that book is there forever. But the reality is that's not a really, a uh, that's just me fearing failure, me fearing that it's not going to be received well, me fearing that I don't have the capacity to write it. That's just what that is. And so by sitting in that silence, well, lack of silence with the frogs, but nothing else, no blue light, no bullshit. I was able to identify that fear and and logic it away and use that time to develop a, a, a path for myself to solving that. And so I challenge each and every one of you to think bigger. If you wanted to be a singer, if you wanted to be a poet, if you wanted to, you know, play jazz trombone, I don't fucking know, like whatever it is that you think you should have continued to pursue, um, sit with it. See if it's still there. See if that call to action is still resonating with you. And if it is, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And this is another area that I think causes a lot of doubt for people. They feel that fear of failure because if it doesn't happen now, if it isn't perfect now, if it isn't something that they can automatically step up to and be organically amazing at, well, then this isn't for me. This isn't for me and I should just let it go because I'm an idiot for even thinking I was possible. The reality is Thomas Edison failed at making a light incandescent light bulb 1,000 times. And when he was asked about it, and everybody knows this story, he said, I didn't fail a 1,000 times. I found a 1,000 different ways not to make a light bulb. Now, that's an amazing quote because the reality is I've had ventures. Everybody on this call I know has had some venture in their life that failed and it was iterative. But if they cared enough about it, they kept at the iterations. Winston Churchill has an amazing quote and he says, success is going from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. The reality is that when you're mining, when you're trying to get from point A to point B, you're going to take wrong turns that don't get you there, but it's going to bring an experience. It's going to level up a skill set. If I'm digging through dirt and I'm missing gold, missing gold, missing gold, and I give up on the fourth swing and that gold's at five, well, then I'm never going to hit gold. Failure is when you quit, not when it doesn't go your way. And when you recalibrate your mindset away from failure is when it doesn't go my way, which is where most of us are calibrated. Excuse me. Most of us are calibrated where failure is when it doesn't go our way, when it isn't perfect, when we didn't strike gold first swing, when we didn't you know, have the strength right out the get. But that's a that's that's a poor calibration of success because the reality is nobody has become successful on a single swing. Everybody that you believe is lucky is not lucky. They just kept at it longer than you. And they put in the time and they were willing to fail, right? Another quote that comes to mind, the master has failed more times than the amateur has ever tried, right? That, that, that in itself is exactly what I'm talking about. So when you're beating yourself up over, it's not where I want it yet, and Tish knows, um, she soundboards for me a lot. Matt knows they soundboard for me a lot when we're on our calls. As steward of heroes, I oftentimes will start to beat myself up because I want speed. I want to develop momentum faster than we're developing momentum. That's on me. That is me setting an expectation that is unrealistic for what we've done. And it's also me robbing myself of the pride and the joy of the progress we've already made. 
right? We use the app, the member portal app very, very often now, because when we first started talking about the app, we said that it was five years out and $18,000 later. And now we're here. And in three months, we built the app and we presented it to the member portal and everybody loves it. So what we originally calibrated as impossible was not impossible. It was just infeasible at the time. By continuing that conversation, asking the right questions, developing the right tenacity to go after those things, we allowed ourselves to make the infeasible possible. And we did so in a shorter amount of time because we just didn't let it go. We were like a dog with a bone, just never let it go. And when you're developing faith in yourself, that's what you need. You need tenacity. You need grit. And you develop that by every time you get into the abyss, every time you get in the darkness, you just look at it and say, not today. Even if, so in my experience in the military, you have light discipline. Light discipline is something they teach um, because a lot of people don't understand how fast the speed of light truly is. And a lot of people don't understand that when you're in the pitch black of the field, a single cigarette end, the ember of a cigarette can be seen from three miles away. As long as there's no obstruction, the single end of an ember can be seen from three miles away. That's almost 15,000, almost 20,000 feet that a single ember can be seen by the human eye and then pitch black. So the reason I tell you that is because when you're in the abyss, when you're in the darkness, when you're finding yourself totally and unequivocally fucked, mentally, spiritually broken, it only takes a spark to see that in the darkness. Now, the cool thing about the member portal is when you're stuck like that and you're in that darkness, use the portal. Because someone in here is not in that darkness and they have enough light for you to see that spark in your darkness. And that's the whole point of the tribe. That's the whole point of the community. That's what I leverage Tish for. That's what I leverage Matt for. That's what I leverage our team for. When I'm stuck, when I feel like Heroes isn't moving or I don't know what I'm doing or I get in my own head and I'm like, man, we should be further. We should be having this. I leverage my team. I lean on my team. And I said, what do you think? And they're like, you're fucking out of your mind. We've done a lot. And that's their light for me. Now, I need quite a bit of stern talking because that's just how I'm wired. Not everybody's like that, right? So they can just straight up tell me you're fucking off your board and we'll be moving from there, right? Sometimes that'll maybe upset some people. But for me, that's exactly what works. You know, I go to Matt and Tish and they're like, you're off your gourd. And I'm like, all right, so how do we move me back onto my gourd? And we move, right? And we just inch our way further every time. And the number one thing all three of us have said to each other when we started Heroes Veritas is we will not quit. We play the infinite game. Now, I use a quote personally that I share with everybody. Life is the game that can be played. It can never be won. The, the meaning behind that is there's no winning life. There's levels to life. You can reach that level that you're targeting. But as soon as you're at that level, you guess what happens? You find a new level that you want to get to. It could be material. It could be, I want a new house, a bigger house, a better car, more status, whatever. It could be more money. It could be more philanthropy. It could be, I want to donate more. I want to help more people, right? Whatever it is, every time you reach a level, you're going to hit a new level. And so the damage that we do to ourselves is in between levels. And in between those levels, we start to wonder, will I ever reach that level? And then we quit. But the only thing certain about quitting is that you'll never reach that level. If you never quit, if you never give up, if you persevere through all the bullshit, you trudge through all the mud, I guarantee you it is absolutely impossible for you to fail. It's impossible. Because you're always making progress. You're always moving towards it. The same way that if I want to ruck a 20-mile hike, it is impossible for me not to hit 20 miles as long as I keep moving. It doesn't matter if I move an inch. It doesn't matter if I move a mile. It doesn't matter if I move a foot an hour but eventually I will hit that 20 miles as long as I don't quit. The only sure way to fail is to quit. So it isn't always about faith in self. And, and this is why I'm using all these quotes. This is why I'm saying all these things is we misunderstand faith in self as I believe I can do this all the time, no matter what. And that's what confidence is. And that's how you succeed. It's not. In fact, if you're like that, I guarantee you're probably going to quit. Why? Because it's not going to come easy. Your mindset has already wired you to think that it's right over that next hill. 
It's right around the, the that next problem. It's 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 in that next moment. It's in that next choice. It's in that next mistake. Whatever it is, you believe that it's that next thing. And every time you get to that point and it's not there, you get further and further down the rabbit hole of disappointment. You get further and further down the tailspin of doubt and dismay and anxiety. So it's not born from having faith in self. It's born from having faith you will not stop. I posted about this uh, yesterday about uh, my day 10 of 75 hard. My day was fucked. Every plan I had went right out the window. I had systems go down. I had to fix this. I had to fix that. I had back-to-back -back calls. I had to still handle my stuff. And by 5 p.m., I still had two 45-minute workouts to do. I still had a half a gallon of water to drink. I had a progress picture to take. And I needed to get back on, on eating right. I didn't eat bad. I just didn't eat the things I was supposed to because I was busy. Now, I could have easily been like, oh, well, quit now. Start tomorrow. But if I want to get 75 days of consistency, then that means I cannot quit. And it doesn't matter if I'm up till midnight, 1 o'clock, finishing that out before I crash out and go to the rack. I'm going to finish that shit that, when I get to it in that day. And I'll start again tomorrow so that I can maintain that progress. And so at five o'clock, I walked out to my home gym. I have a very humble home gym. And I just did a lot of body weight stuff, some 25 pound dumbbell stuff for triceps and bench. And then I just did pull ups and chin ups to failure with a 45 plate around my waist. And I did that until the 45 minute ringer went off. Then I took an hour, got some food, got on the bike and took off. 45 more minutes. During that time, I drank my water and I succeeded yesterday. And the reason that I was able to succeed was because I had calibrated my mind to understand that failure was not an option. Quitting was not an option. Giving up was not an option. And with that came this idea of the question, how do I succeed versus how come this happened? They sound kind of similar to a lot of people, but I'm going to tell you they're vastly different in outcome. One solves the problem. One creates a hurdle that you will not get around because you're spending all your time wondering why it happened and woe is me and sitting in your own dismay and sitting in your own darkness. And the other empowers you to make a decision, to make movement. Like I said, whether it's an inch, an hour, or a mile, an hour, it doesn't matter. You're moving. You make that decision by asking the question, how do I make this work? The guy that I used to be would have been like, oh, it's five o'clock. I'm just going to start again tomorrow. I'm just going to relax the rest of the day. I'm tired. I'm stressed out. I'm frustrated. I'm excited for tomorrow because today is over and I can start fresh. And you know what? I'm okay with it. What else could I do? I would have been that guy. But the way that I am now, it's like, oh, it's five o'clock. Even if I went to bed at, at 10, that still gives me five hours to do two 45 minute workouts and still leave me with about three hours to do whatever the fuck I want to do. You see, calibrating success is important, but calibrating failure, calibrating quitting is much more important. As long as you're making movement. And then the last point that I wanted to make before I open it up to a round table. I wanted to keep this short because this is a very simple but difficult task for a lot of people. You will not succeed immediately and you will not succeed in one try. It is absolutely impossible. Why I say that is because darkness will come, failure will be at your doorstep, mishaps will happen, mistakes will take place, you're going to have self-doubt. You're going to wonder if this is the right way. You're going to doubt it. You're going to have moments where you want to burn it all to the ground. If you are not wanting to burn it to the ground, then you're probably not reaching high enough. If you do not want to quit at some point, if you are not scared of failure at some point, if you are not scared of judgment at some point, you're playing it safe. That's the reality. You are not challenging yourself at all. The only way to be liked by everyone is to say, say nothing, do nothing, and be nothing. That's a quote too. So if you're striving for greatness, get it in your head that darkness is going to chase you 
The devil's going to come for you. The judgment's going to be there. The mistakes are going to be there. The missteps are going to be there. The, the self-doubt's going to be there. The imposter syndrome is going to be there. It is part of it. Don't dismiss it. The only people that don't have that are narcissists, and they generally don't do a fucking thing. I'll be honest with you. Because they're too busy thinking they're the greatest shit since white bread, and they're not. So the reality is, the sooner you can accept that the darkness is part of the process, the sooner you're going to hit success. As the quote from earlier was, success is going from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. I actually agree with that in a long run. Looking at it holistically at the whole picture, success is going from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. The problem that I see with that in the short term, in the short run, is that people equate that to, I will never lose enthusiasm. That's not true. You're going to lose enthusiasm. You're going to doubt yourself. You're going to question, what the fuck am I doing? Is this even worth it? Why am I making my life so hard? Tish and Matt know, I ask myself that all the time. I have a great day job. I can literally sit back and just let the checks roll in, do my job. I do it like second nature. It's very easy to me. I can just chill out, hit my retirement, end at 70, maybe 65, relax. But I'm not wired that way. If I was to do that, I can guarantee you I'd get suicidal. And I can guarantee that because I've done it. Some people are wired for that. And that's okay. And it's okay to not want all of this stuff. But if you are wired that way, and if you're part of this group, you probably are wired like that. Wired for something more. Wired for greatness. Wired for something bigger than yourself. Don't let anybody convince you that you're not. Don't let anybody convince you that you should play it safe. Nobody should be able to convince you to turn down your thermostat, to teach you that you're not good enough, that you're not capable, that you need to just play it safe. Don't let their cowardice ruin your greatness, ever. And get a team, get people around you that when you are in that darkness, and that's what this portal is really for, when you're stuck, when you don't know what the fuck you're doing, which happens to all of us at some point, inevitably, when you're reaching for a level you've never been in, you're going to not have any idea what the fuck you're doing at some point. But mm, when heads are, you know, two heads are better than one, five heads are better than two, so on and so forth, the more people you can use as soundboards, the more faith you're going to have in yourself because you're going to have all these ideas and you're going to have a bunch of people in your back pocket that are not going to let you quit because they're going to see the potential in you. And saying that, if you have, if you're surrounded by people who want you to quit, if you are surrounded by people who love to tell you, I told you so, if you are surrounded by people who love to tell you why you are asked questions like, who do you think you are? Cut those motherfuckers out. Cut them out. You don't have to explain fucking nothing to them either. Just stop prioritizing time with them because they are holding you back. They are holding you back. They're holding you down. And it's only because they're uncomfortable with your growth. Don't let them destroy your growth because there's fucking chicken shits. I said it when we released this portal. You will find your partner here. You will find your best friend here. You will find the next business relationship here because every single person that's in this group wants to see other people win. They're there asking you why you aren't looking bigger. Our group is here to ask you why you think you should only stop at impossible and not impossible plus. That's what our group is here for. And people that are not wired like that will not last here. They will not last here because they will get very fucking uncomfortable with the way we push for things. And that's the reality. So with that being said, do we have any questions? How do you keep progress forward with negative people around you? You don't. You don't. If you're keeping them around you, your progress will stall. 
your responsibility and your choice is to create a boundary that they don't have access to that side. And then those people behind it. The best way to kill a great idea is to tell it to small-minded people. Mm -hmm. So when you ask, when you have any people around you, I don't care if it's your mom, your dad, your cousin, your grandfather, your best friend, your wife, your husband, your children, I don't care. The way you do that is you create a boundary and you say, don't talk to me about that. Don't ask me about it. Don't ask me what I'm doing. Don't insert your advice. I don't care. You're on a different level. I recently saw a video of this guy talking about how when I was in, when I was thinking the impossible and dreaming of the impossible, you couldn't even dream yourself part of it. So when I'm doing it, don't fucking ask to be part of it. Because I dreamed of the impossible before you could even see it was possible. And that's the that's how you handle negativity. That's how you handle negative people. Now, especially with family members, blood family members, I get it. It's hard to get rid of them. I mean, I'm I cut my mom out for two years because I just wasn't going to deal with it. And it completely recalibrated our relationship because she realizes that she couldn't be granted anymore. Am I going to sit here and tell you it was easy? Hell no. That shit was the most diff I wanted my mom. I miss my mom. I wanted to be around her, but she does not get to control my life. And anytime she gets back to that place where she thinks she gets to tell me what to do, I put that boundary back up and I let her know, hey, we're not doing this. You want to continue down this road? You won't hear from me for a while. Negative people are a poison. And I, I use a watering hole methodology when it comes to negativity. One drop of poison can ruin an entire watering hole. One drop. It might be diluted, but it'll always have adverse effects. If you need to, go find a new well and fucking tap that shit with, with positive people. If where you're at has got a lot of negativity, get it out of your life. It's not worth it. It's going to hold you back. Can you explain the infinite game versus finite game for personal belief in self? Yeah. So finite games have defined rules, defined players, and defined outcomes. That's what a finite game is. Baseball is a great concept, right? I have so many players on the field. I do this to get points. This is how long the game is. When it ends, whoever has the most points wins. That's a finite game. When it comes to self-belief, there are no there are no prescribed rules. There's no prescribed time limit. There are no prescribed outcomes. There's no defined outcomes. If you wake up one day and you're like, I want to be great at guitar, and you start playing guitar, and you realize, I fucking hate this. This is the stupidest shit that I ever thought I would do. It's okay to just put it down and be like, that doesn't serve me. I'm going to pick up piano instead. Whatever it is, right? Or even more drastically, Fuck guitar, I'm gonna go snowboarding. I don't know. It does not matter. There's no describe, there's no prescribed rule set. So if you don't like something, it's okay to quit that thing if it's not serving you. So when you're looking at the infinite mindset, there's there's two things that really are born out of the infinite mindset when it comes to life. One, you're in complete control. You're in complete control of the speed, the rules, the players, who's there, who's not there, what you're trying to get, what you're trying to achieve, how long it's going to take you to achieve that. That's the infinite mindset. You don't have to, if somebody's like, hey, you need to have $100,000 in three months, you can go, go fuck yourself. I don't care because I'm going to do it in a year because I don't want to give up my time. And that person who's playing that game where they've described their own mindset or they've made their own finite game of, I need to do it in three months, they're probably fucking miserable. Because if they don't hit that three months, then they've screwed themselves. Whereas if you just play the infinite game of like, well, I'm going to hit 100,000. I'm just going to keep doing the things until I get there. However long it takes, it gets there. I'm just, the outcome is I want 100,000. It's a much more enjoyable journey. Because you're not putting all these confines on yourself and giving yourself structures to uh, demean yourself and destroy your own self-confidence and self-worth. And so the second thing that it gives you is time. Time has two ways of looking at time, Newtonian time and Einsteinian time. Now, this is getting a little bit more into the quantum mechanics and physics side of the house, but Newtonian side, Isaac Newton came up with gravity. That guy, he's kind of important. Um, he prescribed time as 
you either have too much or you don't have enough. So you're either wasting time or you're spending time, right? There's only two ways to do it. And what that does is it creates a finite space for you to feel the urgency of time. I don't have enough time in the world. However, in Einsteinian time, it's relativity. So if a minute becomes an hour, an hour becomes a week, and a week becomes a year, then you have all the time in the world. And the best way to think about this is when you're doing something you love. Everybody's done this. Everybody's had this moment. You're at work. You fucking hate what you're doing. That first hour of work feels like an eternity. It's only been an hour, but it feels like an eternity. Then you go home, you spend time with a loved one that you absolutely love, you're laughing it up, and all of a sudden, eight hours feels like 10 minutes. That's Einsteinian time. That is the infinite equation of time. Is If you find something that you can love so much that you can spend countless hours doing it and getting absolutely productive in it because you just get lost in it, that's infinite time mechanism. Then you don't have to worry about your age. You don't have to worry about how much time you have. You don't have to worry about if it's the weekend or the weekday. You don't have to worry about... Like, do you have five minutes or an hour? Just make use of what the time you have. And however much you get done, you get done. Now, the beauty of all of that is looking at life from an infinite place is, one, you solve the problem of nostalgia, the regrets, the fear of the past, blah, 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 which a lot of people use for darkness, right? Man, I was the high school quarterback. I was the fucking king of the fucking prom. I, you know, those guys that peak in high school and never leave. Yeah, we call that arrested development. Those guys are leveraging Newton's time. They're afraid of running out of time, so they stay stuck in time. It's not the same thing. If they switch their place of Instinian time, they would look at it and go, that was a great time. I learned a lot from it. Let me take those skills and do something over here with it. Conversely, the people that are getting older, the people that are afraid of the age, if you look at it from Newtonian time, you're running out of time. That's a very dark and depressing thing. And it's scary and it makes things inevitably fall apart because you're focusing all your energy on lamenting at the fact that you're getting older instead of using the time you have. If you look at it from Einsteinian time, you can have one day or you can have 30 more years. Who gives a shit? Do the best with what you have right now and then it doesn't matter if you die tomorrow because you did the best with what you got now. Now, if you have a poll here a call to action to go and do something and you're not fucking doing it, stop being an idiot. Go fucking do it. Figure it out. Ask the question, how do I make this happen? Because you're just creating your own deathbed of regret. That's all you're doing, right? Like I, I'm guilty of this more than most. I have parameters that I need to hit before I give myself permission to go and do something. I struggle with it often. I'm trying to plan a camping trip right now. Oh, it's going to be raining and, you know, it's this and I got the dog and I got all these logistics and like, really all I need is I need a place to sit by myself quietly so I can finish my fucking book because I'm stressed out everywhere else. That's all I really need. So are the logistics really that important? No, they're not. I'll figure it out when I get there anyway. So we all have a propensity to do that to ourselves, to create parameters that are finite for us to feel comfortable or safe or whatever. If you get comfortable with being uncomfortable with the parameters being outside of that, that's when you start living an infinite life because you don't need all that stuff. Everything just becomes plug and play. Everything becomes easy. I'm gonna be here at this time. What are we gonna do? I don't fucking know, I don't care. I'll be there and I'll be using that time accordingly. That's how it is. So I hope that answered the question on the infinite, using infinite versus finite. Uh, what do you do when you get into the darkness? So I call this actionable abyss, okay? This is what I, I coined it for myself, is actionable abyss. You're going to get into dark spots. You're going to get stuck. You're going to get... The worst thing you can do is sit down, figuratively. This is what most people do. They wallow. They're like, oh, it's so dark, so hopeless. I don't know what to do. And I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to think about how dark it is and how 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 pitiful I am and, and just wallow in it. Oh, woe is me. There's nothing I can do. Actionable abyss is a, is a pacing mechanism that you do mentally. It's an exploratory audit system that I leverage when I'm in darkness. 
why am I in darkness? Do I see any light? Is there anything I can do? The other thing that I do with an actional bliss is I, as a person, am very action oriented. So when I'm in my darkness, when I'm out of my darkness, I may have 15 things that I want to get done in a day, day to day, 15 tasks that I need to get done to consider the day successful. When I'm up and I'm happy and I'm moving and there's momentum, I feel great about 15 things. But when I'm in my darkness, fucking even taking a shower is going to suck. Like getting up to just do basic hygiene is difficult for me. And I know a lot of people that go through depression and melancholy that go through that same thing. So what I do is I recalibrate the list for abyss. So my actionable abyss isn't going to be 15 high energy required items, high, you know, mental state items. They're going to be three to five very simple tasks that I know that if I got a shower, got a workout in, you know, made a infographic for the business, talked with the team about the business, inspired somebody about the business, then okay, I win. That's the day. I didn't wallow. I didn't say I'm hopeless. I didn't say, you know, like there's woe is me. I can't get out of this. No, I, I said, yeah, this sucks. And the only way out of it is keep going, right? You're already in hell. Keep going. Don't stop. And again, it goes back to grace and gratitude because a lot of times what we do is we get those three things done and then we're like, well, I should have got 15. How dare I only get three? I'm such a pathetic little worm that I only got three, right? We beat ourselves up about it. It's like, no, holy shit. This morning when I woke up, I didn't think I was going to get out of bed. But I got out of bed and not only did I get out of bed, I went to the gym. Not only did I get out of gym, go to the gym, I took a shower. I only to take a shower. I even showed up to work. I wasn't all there, but I did it and I showed up and I'm present. And give yourself that grace because the reality is the only time I feel like you should really beat yourself up is if you gave yourself the wiggle room to quit. You should feel bad about that. Quitting is not an option. Because what you're doing is you're slapping everybody that believes in you in the face. You are choosing to demean everyone that sees your potential. You are choosing to dishonor everyone that believes you're capable of more just because you're tired, just because you're lazy, just because you don't want to deal with it, just because you don't want responsibility for it. But if you get up and you take that shower and you do those things, there's understanding there. They're like, fuck, dude, you're in a dark place, but you showed up for us. And there, there's a lot of psychology behind this too, where, you know, a lot of times when we get into our abyss, we feel like we're not worthy of love. We're not worthy of the people that are around us. We're not worthy of the effort. We're not worthy of these things. And if you take yourself out of it and you say, have a sick pet, you would never think, well, they're not worthy of that. So I'm not going to give them the pills. I'm not going to give them the bath. I'm not going to take care of them. I'm not going to feed them. You would never do that because you care for them. And so if you can't care enough about yourself to do that, lean on the people that are around that do care about you and let them know you're going through it. Now, there's a balance here, and I always talk about it, especially for men when it comes to temperance. I'm not saying get in and whine. I see this a lot with men's groups. They get in and they whine, and they don't do anything with it. It's a waste of fucking time. It's a waste of the people that care about you. What I mean is if you go and you ask for an opinion, and you ask for help when you're in the darkness, and somebody says, hey, why don't we go for a walk? Don't be that person that's like, nah, I, I, I really can't. Well, then don't fucking come and ask me what to do. You have to be responsible for your darkness. You have to own it. You have to take those steps. They're not easy, but they are simple. It doesn't have to be complex. It just takes that no quit mindset again, that whatever happens, I'm going to take that step, even if it's one step, right? I know a buddy, I got a buddy, he's, he's suffering from PTSD right now and he's struggling. And I told him to do one thing a day, walk out, stand in the sun, close his eyes and just listen to the wind in the trees. That's all I asked him to do. If you can do that, you've won. You've won the day. You're done. He did that for about four days. And yesterday he texted me and he's like, dude, I went to the gym today. I was like, good. He's like, I think that the action of getting outside was more mental than I realized. And you just giving it very simple framing of get outside, listen to the word, the wind, be outside in the sunlight. Once I was out there, then it was just kind of like, well, I already made it this far. 
right? I might as well do something with it. And sometimes that's all it needs. That's all when you're in the darkness. Sometimes it just takes somebody pushing the boulder a little bit so that you can create the momentum yourself. Give yourself that opportunity. And if you can't do it, find people around you that are willing to do that for you. That's what I did with Tish and Matt. That's what I do with heroes. I lean on my people. I lean on my tribe. I let them help me. And in doing so, we've we've fostered a deeper trusting relationship because we can lean on each other and know that they're always going to be there. So when you're in your darkness, um, it's very critical to be active and leverage the actionable abyss. Don't just sit and wallow. And then one more question I have. Um, I think I already kind of covered this, but how do you maintain, maintain progress when you're struggling? Um, again, just actionable abyss. When you're struggling, do that next thing. Don't put a parameter on it. Don't tell yourself you need to do 20 things today. Find the things that are the highest priority, the most important, and get them done early, right? If, if you need to go to the gym because you know your mental health is going to suffer, if you don't, don't tell yourself you have to go for two hours. Just start with, I got to show up. Whatever happens after I show up happens, but I got to get there. You get there when you're struggling. That's all it takes, right? My buddy, just go stand out in the sun. All it took for him was to do the task. Once he was there, he, he couldn't justify anymore just sitting. He then had to do something, right? And I'm sure he didn't share everything with me, but I wouldn't be surprised if every day that he went outside, he did something that he didn't tell me about, like walked around and he didn't realize it or did the dishes or took a shower, right? Because it just creates momentum and there's no way to sit still anymore. Just peel yourself off the floor and get going. So, and again, give yourself grace, right? Like my grace is contingent on whether or not I'm I'm doing well or I'm in my actionable list, abyss. If I'm in, if I'm in a light place, if I'm in a high momentum place, if I'm in a high energy place, then I'll probably complete 15, 20, 30 tasks and still be energized by the end of the day and not want to sleep because my brain is like, what about heroes and what about land? And we got to go do this stuff. And what if we hung out of a helicopter and fucking hunted boar for a while? Like my brain is like that when I'm excited, right? Like it'll come up with the most fantastic ideas. But when I'm in my abyss, it's more like, well, that's stupid. And I just got to tone it down. All right, Tim, get up, do the dishes. All right, you did the dishes. All right, if you make it to the gym today, that's a good day, right? Just keep it calibrated to where you're at and don't beat yourself up. The, the best advice I ever got from the few therapy sessions that I went to was stop leveraging your inner monologue as a weapon to continue beating yourself up with. Stop handing yourself weapons to beat yourself up with. Get rid of the weapons. See them as they are, just point blank. This is where I'm at. There's no judgment there. How do I just very matter of fact, how do I get to the gym? How do I get the dishes done? How do I get in the shower? Once you start asking those questions, even when you're struggling, it's very hard for most people, even when they're struggling, it's very hard when they start having those dialogues um, to stand still. Now, the other hurdle is a lot of times in the beginning, having those dialogues are the hard part because they're like, well, why don't I just get in the gym? Oh, because you're a fat piece of shit that's really fucking lazy and blah, 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 right? The minute that happens, again, remove the weapons. That's not it, because I take a shower all the other times. Remove the weapons. So I hope that helps. Any other questions? Got nine minutes. want to be mindful of everybody's time. No, I think that was good, Tim. I think it's a, a piece of having faith in yourself is also that um, ability to, or finding that ability to give yourself uh, the grace of like, well, just one little thing today is the success, you know? And, and because we're adulting, you know, all of these things, we have to do all of these things in order to have a successful day. But sometimes it's just that little thing. You know, I walked out, your, your person walked outside you know, and again, probably not realizing it, they accomplished a few more of the things that were on the to-do list, but had they written it on the to-do list, it would have been overwhelming. Yeah. So, so those are cool. It's, it, it's a good thing. I know it's a hard place for a lot of people. Um, you know, I mean, I, Deborah and I in the gym last night and we had uh, our women's group and one of the gals in the women's group I and mean, all three of us were standing by like, we just don't want to be here. We just, we just don't want to be here. And it was like, look, just just go grab a kettlebell and just drag it out. Like, 
just, you know, just put some weight on the bar and just sit under it. Something will magically happen. You know? and, and an hour does. later, you know, an hour later, we're done with the workout. And, and as we joked at the beginning, at the end of the workout, we were like, well, that sucked really bad. But, you know, we did an hour's worth of a workout and we're done. We're going home. But, you know, it's, 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 um, it is sometimes just that little bit, that little tiny piece of walking forward, giving yourself grace to just do one little thing. And it doesn't have to be that we conquered the world or we jumped out of an airplane. We just simply dusted the front porch, you know, and, and, and got the leaves off so that we could walk out tomorrow and try to stand on that front porch with a little bit of sunshine in our face. And so, I think there's a lot to be said about that tribe too, is like the election of the people that you have around you. Yeah. Because if all three of you were feeling that, if one person was like, well, fuck it, let's get mimosas, probably everybody would be like, fuck it, let's go get mimosas. We would have. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, but instead, each of you had made a commitment to each other that that was what you were there to do. And so with one person saying, fuck, I don't want to be here and everybody else commiserating, but not accepting that commiseration, right? Like exactly. everybody collectively said, yeah, this sucks, but we're here. And right. so there was an elevation there that, maybe you you did or you didn't understand happened or, or took place where at some point somebody was looking if not all of you were looking for that one person to go it's okay but instead yeah. you were like it is okay as long as you keep going right it's okay to feel that way it's okay to commiserate and we all think that this sucks and we all agree that this sucks but we're here and it's not okay to stay here with and and just letting it die there we're going to move forward. And by the end of it, you're like, yeah, well, we all agree that that sucked, but Hey, we never regret anything we do. Right. Like right. we regret the things that we don't do. So um, I think that's really important. Again, going back to like the energy of a tribe is very important and how you elicit that energy says infinitely more about the collective than it does, you know, with outcomes, right? Like a lot mm -hmm. of people think that the outcomes of a, of a tribe or the outcomes of a group are, are extremely important. And while those are, tertiarily important they are byproducts of everything that takes place up to that point and i think that's really cool that your guys's group did that yeah mm -hmm. it's a great story thank you for sharing mm -hmm. anything else we right. that's it we'll get some info out about the event on the 18th great um i think do uh, squat do what do so just, just squat, squat. Just get <laughs> I can't, Matt. That's the problem. I just came from acupuncture and you shoved the needle in my ass. I'm like that's all I can do to sit here. All like, I can think about is the here. peanut butter shot from the military. Anytime somebody says like, <laughs> if anybody is confused, the peanut butter shot in the Marine Corps or in any military branch is a shot that they give you for it's a concoction so that you don't get sick with all the stuff that comes from being in a barracks with a bunch of the guys. But it's a thick fluid. And they shoot it in your ass, and you have to sit down and roll it around so that it oh. disperses. So it's so fucking painful. And then right after, they usually make you run. So right. everybody's kind of gimp running for the first <laughs> half because it's just so painful. And anytime somebody says they got a shot in the ass, that's what I think of is that nice. horrific <laughs> moment that we all had to go through if you've been in the military. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, great. Thank you all. Thank you for joining. Um, talk soon. I really love the activity in the portal let's keep it up and again if we if we see anybody or know anybody or want anybody in the portal um, please get them invited because we need some new blood we've all been in there a while it's always good to get new viewpoints i don't want an echo chamber or a silo so the more people we can get in there the better we are to serve each other awesome thanks everyone have a good week thank you you too. take care take care Bye.